Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's panel on uh, leading livestock enterprises across Australia. Thank you all for joining. And of course, thank you to our panelists for joining as well. We will do some introductions shortly. But first of all, my name is John Fargo, one of the co-founders here at AgriWeb, and I'm joined by my colleague, Will Bruce, uh, who looks after the Australian geography for us. Um, so by a quick, quick introduction, um, I personally grew up on a, uh, on a sheep and cattle station in Northern South Australia always been you know really passionate about livestock agriculture but also bringing innovation and technology uh, particularly to kind of larger scale livestock enterprises and i guess for me you know when i look back in in you know what my father and grandfather were doing in in the 50s and 60s and 70s you know we saw sort of fundamental shift in you know what was literally everything run by horses had had a staff of 40 into you know motorbikes uh, and eventually into to an airplane so some major fundamental shifts from what would take literally a month to muster a paddock to, to, to a number of hours. Uh, so some amazing transformational shifts in the way we were running our business, um, just a family business. When we look back now in the last, say, 10, 20, 30 years, we haven't seen any of the same fundamental step changing shifts. Uh, and we see this globally. We see the livestock industry being the least digitized industry um, of, of, the, of the ag industry, which is obviously the least digitized industry in the world as well. Um, so some great opportunities there. And, and we're really seeing a lot of change in the last say five years uh, with investment in, in innovation, a lot of change uh, and technology is, is a big piece of that. So really excited to, to host uh, today's session. Uh, Will, do you like to give your quick introduction? Yeah, thanks, John. So great to be on uh, the webinar this afternoon. And by way of introduction, so as John said, I look after the Australian business here um, out of Sydney. Um, I'm a long way from home and after multiple generations uh, farming in the UK, in Kent, in Southeast England, I joined Agrib in 2018 after 10 years, originally working at PwC in London and then latterly for a big multinational software company and uh, made the move down south mainly because of the, the opportunity, as John has just talked about, and the fact that um, this is an industry that I'm, I'm passionate about providing a solution to from a technology perspective. It, through no fault of its own, and those involved in it, it, within it has been grossly neglected in many ways, as John talks about for the last you know, 10, 20, 30 years, and here to provide hopefully a solution and that innovation that we're gonna talk about today to the industry as a whole. So uh, it's great to be on, really excited for the next 90 minutes and looking forward to hearing from everyone that's uh, joined us across the country. 
Absolutely, and and I guess before we, we run some intros uh, across our panel, for those of you who are not familiar with Agrib, we are a livestock management platform um, that's sort of servicing customers all across the world. Here in Australia, we look after about 5,000 customers, uh, about 12 million head that, that we currently manage, uh, and and you know we have we have a large um, a large focus and support a, a lot of large pastoral organisations across Australia. Obviously, joined by three today, which is which is really really exciting uh, and great to see a number of our clients also joining in and, and listening. So hopefully, we can. Uh, we can have a shout out to them later, uh, but really exciting to, to, to bring this uh, session to you all today. And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to run through uh, the next 90 minutes or so. Uh, please feel free to fire questions through in the Q&A section at the bottom. You can also vote for your uh, preferred question if you want that to get answered. And of course, we're going to record this uh, and then send it out to those who registered as well. So you'll have a, have a copy of that. Um, and for any of those Twitter followers, get on, uh, on Twitter and find everyone's handle that's uh, currently uh, on the call. Uh, and so without further ado, I might hand it over to um, an introduction to our panelists to kind of give their, their name, intro, um, and what they do at their organisation, and I guess what innovation in livestock enterprises uh, means to them. So Anthony uh, from Paraguay Pastoral, I might hand it over to you first. Fantastic. Thanks, John and Will, and um, welcome everyone. And thanks, thanks for having me along today. Um, Anthony Chambers, I'm a Paraguay Pastoral company. I look after technology for the for the company um, across infrastructure and service management, our connectivity to all our stations, our corporate and business systems. So what what technology we use to support our business. And then, of course, our on-farm and production technology that is, that, are, that is used across all our stations across Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, I've been at Paraguay for just on 18 months now, so joined at the beginning of last year. And prior to that was in consulting, so I worked for the, one of the big four consulting firms um, and really focused on private mainly private equity clients and investment management clients. Um, for technology and corporate operations, particularly around strategy, transactions, M&A transactions, and then also business transformation. Um, prior to that, got a background in financial markets uh, and technology in financial markets, but um, hugely passionate about agriculture. This is um, working at Paraway as a culmination of bringing together agriculture and technology, uh, which is what I'm passionate about and, uh, and great to be here today with uh, John and the team. Thank you, Anthony. So you and Will broke out of the big four, uh, broke out of the finance game and saw the light to come back to ag. So there you go. I think it's a, a trend we are seeing, which is obviously really exciting. Um, Dan, do you want to, uh, do you want to give, give a quick intro there, mate? So Dan, you're still on mute. Uh, if you just want to un unmute yourself and then we'll yep. fire Perfect. away. Okay. We got you. Looking? Yep. Yep. I was saying you can put me in the bucket of breaking out of what was then called the big five. My first job out of university was Arthur Anderson, which obviously did not survive Enron. Um, but yeah, then moved into corporate finance and, and agriculture about 12, 13 years ago from a corporate point of view. Um, originally in an African ag fund, uh, then spent four years at Macquarie, based in London, uh, and then formed Gun Agri Partners in 2013 with two other Macquarie um, colleagues. But I grew up on a, a mixed cattle and cropping uh, operation in northern New South Wales um, and you know saw firsthand you know some of the things John just mentioned that, you know my dad you know who sold his farm at the ripe old age of 75 has never owned a mobile phone so you know there's a real there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in in the sector and um, the changing age demographic of farmers we, we find really exciting. Um, Gun Agri just a bit of background uh, we currently manage about $225 million of assets uh, in our first strategy, which is a northern grass-fed uh, cattle operation. We use agri in that operation, uh, very happily so. Um, running about 70,000 head from the Gulf down to Gundawindi, so all in Queensland. But we're also a, um, you know, a farm management business working on a um, greenfield almond development and also a transformation of farming, mixed farm uh, strategy as we speak. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And, and look, you, you know, you raise a good point around the average age of, of the farmer, not just in Australia, but, but 
basically across the world. Uh, and you know, one thing we are seeing sitting here virtually in a virtual world that that you know that the age of digital ag is definitely here. COVID has driven that. Uh, we see that firsthand where you know we used to spend a lot of time on the road. Um, you know, with clients training uh, on farm with it, with our with our big clients and those types of things, uh, and being able to move that into a digital world uh, and having people, uh, you know, hundreds of people uh, sign up for an event like this is is really really exciting and a big step forward for the industry. So, um, more to talk about that. Uh, Bill, love to love to hear from you and your introduction. Thanks, John. Thanks, Will. Thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, so I, I'm asset performance manager at AAM. Um, bit of my background, I, I grew up on a cattle property as well, like the other fellas, which is interesting. And um, I studied industrial design at uni. Then I actually started, uh, my first job out of uni was uh, with this business a number of years ago when it was uh, in the livestock exchange side of things, um, which are the sale yards. So a couple of years there and then got into software, um, started um, a software business around uh, early childhood education, which was a bit different. Um, got that up and running and then worked for uh, the development company that built that uh, as a, well, it ended up being the sales manager of, of that team. And what that involved was, um, it was consulting, a lot of consulting and working with a lot of businesses and startups, understanding what it is that they're trying to achieve out of technology and putting together a solution to meet what they're looking for. Um, so it goes back to that experience in design and really understanding the, the user's needs. And I think that's served me pretty well through, through that process. And, and that's what I'm applying here at AAM. So AAM um, is, is very diverse in terms of what it um, manages. So from cattle and sheep cropping, um, chickens, that sort of timber production and the livestock exchanges as well. Um, my role is to identify what problems each of those units are facing and each of the businesses within the units are facing and come up with solutions that are really driven by the, the demand, by the problem and where there are opportunities to consolidate these solutions. That's, that's a big part of what I'm doing as well. Um, but really a, a facilitator between the subject matter experts at each of the funds, each of the businesses and the technical experts who can deliver the solutions. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a very broad, very interesting um, business and really excited to be a part of it. Um, I think that just about covers it. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Bill. And I, and I think, you know, such a well-rounded uh, group that we, that we have here on this afternoon and, and also the common thread is, is you know agriculture being in in the blood or passion of, of some degree, but also bringing expertise and skills from other industries in, seeing how it's been done elsewhere, whether it being in, in finance, banking, uh, technology, software startups, all those types of things, uh, and really bringing best practice into the industry of agriculture. It's something that we're really really passionate about here. Here at AgriWeb is is okay. Well, we need that. We need that harness that raw knowledge and, and, and expertise of farming to make sure that we're really, you know, understanding and living for the farmer, but also bringing in best practice tools, processes and techniques to actually make a difference and make an impact. Um, so I think that that's something that's that's really coming through from from you three gentlemen. So really appreciate, uh, really appreciate you joining. And look, you know, what a perfect place to start and, and kick things off around, you know, investing for the future. Um, and maybe Anthony, if we could hand it over to you, I'd just, just love to, to understand, you know, obviously been um, at Paraway a, a shortish period of time, you know, two years or so, uh, and part of your job was, was coming in and, and looking at how you're gonna sort of innovate and invest in the future. Um, how did you go about that when you joined Paraway, looking at, at the current business and, and where you wanted to take that and where the leadership wanted to take that business? Yeah, sure. And, and I think coming in, as you said, only 18 months ago, um, Paraway is a diverse business. We, we run four and a half million odd hectares from, from Burktown in the north of Queensland down to, to the south of Victoria. And, and to come in and look at how we were going to go about investing in technology, where we were going to focus on our innovation. Um, the, the first thing for me was to come in and, and really have a look at what we were currently doing, having a look at that current state 
talking to our business, talking to the guys on the ground, the guys in the yards, and also the, the, the teams in, in the business support office in Orange and look at what was working well and, and, and what wasn't working well um, and where were there key gaps in our, in our, in our footprint um, and, and across all aspects of the business, whether it was cattle, sheep or cropping. Um, so that, that was really my first step was to come in and have a look at that current state. And then once we had a view of, or once I had a view of what we were using where and, and how it was going, it was really then to then flip that lens and then start looking and talking to our business about what do we want the future to look like? What do we want technology to, to, to benefit the business and where and, and how do we think it could? Um, and, and really look at, I guess, developing a picture of, of in a perfect world, what would it look like? Um, and in some cases, we didn't have all the answers. We, we knew that there was an opportunity or we knew that there was a gap and we didn't know exactly what was going to go in there, but we thought, you know, we had a thesis that technology could be a, a huge benefit. So we started to pull together that picture of what we wanted the world to look like. And, and then we went about how do we get from A to B? How do we get from where we were, that current state? Um, and then how do we get to where we want to be? and plan for that. What, what key initiatives did we need to, to make that jump? What were the key innovations that we needed to leverage? Where, where do we need key bits of investment to, to make those jumps? Um, and, that, and that really formed the basis of a plan for, for us and how we were going to leverage technology more, how we were going to look at how we, we put innovation into play. And yeah, I, I think we also, during that process, worked out that technology, you know, in any business is fundamental to growth. And, and I think probably in agriculture, it's even more relevant. Um, you know, there, there's an opportunity there to leverage technology, an opportunity across agriculture and the livestock production space in our case to, um, to certainly take advantage of that. And, and Anthony, you mentioned that kind of A to B process. How did you go about engaging those internal stakeholders? to invest in that technology, something that we see time and again in the internal aspect of Paraway. Any thoughts on how you went through that engagement process? Yeah, obviously, I think in any business, the, the engagement of your internal stakeholders is, is highly critical to the success of, of adoption of technology and, and the deployment of technology. Um, and so from, from our perspective, I guess, we, we really went about trying to understand our stakeholders' requirements um, and that was across all facets of the business. Um, what was important to them? What were their key requirements? Um, and it was really important to get their engagement there because the, for some of these innovations and for the adoption of this technology to be a success, we, we needed these stakeholders across the business to be engaged and, and to, to feel like technology was going to deliver them success um, and, and deliver their business on the ground um, value. Um, and so I think then through that, it was being transparent, you know, what do we know is in the market? What's not in the market? What do we see working well? What do we not see working well and communicating as much as possible, um, and, and making sure that our key stakeholders had, I guess, the right information at hand, um, and an opportunity to, to understand the benefits of what technology could deliver their businesses. Um, but also you know, realistically, the costs, the, the costs of investing in that technology to deliver those benefits. So it was that transparency, yeah, I think, that was key as well. It's uh, communication we'll come on to in, in, in a latter part of the, the session today. But um, switching tack to Bill, so you know, exciting times, the fund is growing, which is brilliant, and that the property portfolio is potentially increasing over time. How, how do you balance about the thought of investing for the future and, and just deciding, I guess, between those short-term um, investments, the, the more operational improvements, which you've already touched on, and the longer term strategy. Is that, is that something that you think through daily, weekly, monthly, um, in terms of the timeframes involved? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, a daily, um, it's a daily concern because there are opportunities coming up every day, um, problems being identified that we can uh, try to solve. But we also need to keep an eye on what's going to be possible in the very long term. So any sort of infrastructure projects that we're doing in the short term really need to consider the possibilities. And it needs to, in a funny sort of a way, consider things that we don't even know are possible yet. So to give you an example, and I'm gonna give this 
presentation software a well, and I'm not too sure how we're going. Let's there. do it, Bill. Yep, right, let's do it. So this this is a little um, plug for AgriWeb. This is the map showing um, Lejeune, property up in the Northern Territory. Um, and one of the challenges we have here is it's a fairly large area and it's um, obviously, and it's, the wet season plays with you know getting around obviously and what we're interested in doing is gathering data on say weather um, and water depth and um, also extending that into livestock movements and weights and other indicators for their performance so we have this telemetry project telemetry or sensors and we're also interested in um, how we can give better visibility to our investors on what's happening in a really literal sense so setting up cameras, for example. So we have two sort of requirements. One can be addressed with technology that's on the market and readily available in terms of sensors. We can set up little GPS units that can connect the sensors and send that information, but those units won't support you know, really, really high resolution, really sharp pictures of what's happening there. And beyond just showing the immediate need now, beyond just the immediate need of giving that better visibility, there's opportunities for um, having those images being analysed by computers and estimating weights, for example. That's not happening now, but it's in development with a number of businesses that are out there. And it goes to the point where we've got these short-term problems, long-term opportunities. How do we address one while considering the other? Um, and it's a, it's a constant consideration, really. Um, it, it makes it very, it make, it's very interesting, but it's also important to make sure that we're delivering on what is required uh, operationally in the short term and to make sure that anything that we do invest in is giving them that return, um, keeping an eye on the big picture at the same time. It's a tricky balance for sure. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. And we're going to come, come back onto that, that ROI piece uh, shortly. One thing that, that I just wanted to pick up on there, you said around reporting into, into your investors, a, a shift I've seen, you know, in my experience is in this relationship where there's, um, you know, large amount of shareholders or investors, typically the visibility has been quite poor. It's been, you know, some top level stock numbers and rainfall at best that come across every quarter or something like that. What do you see within your business, um, and, and if anyone else has got a view on this on, on the panel, around demand from shareholders and, and larger stakeholders for more insights, for more understanding of what's happening at a production level, uh, and, and the ability to get that information efficiently, quickly, and accurately to those stakeholders? Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, yes, it's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity to, for the whole industry to improve how we're giving that visibility more broadly. I think the immediate focus for us is providing that information to the people who are making the decisions uh, on the ground. So it's one thing for us to be collecting lots of information and have you know, huge spreadsheets and big databases, but turning that into information, turning that into something that the, the managers and, and the staff at the businesses can actually use is something that we've got a big focus on at the moment. Um, AgriWeb, again, handles it really nicely. So it takes, especially with um, products, you know, enhancements that are coming online around individual animal management. Um, so being able to identify the top and bottom performers, um, we can put a lot of data through the system and it can really simply give that insight for the managers on the property. Um, so in terms of that type of reporting, it's, a lot of it's about timeliness. You need to be able to do that in the yards while you're drafting, while you're processing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of opportunity to improve though, for sure. No, absolutely. And, and um, Anthony, I don't know whether you've got a view on, on, you know, pressure from higher up in the business to have more granularity around uh, what's happening at that production level uh, within a structure like, like your business. Sorry, I think you're on mute, Anthony. Yeah. Sorry, press the button twice. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it pressure. I, I think um, data, you know, we're, we're very conscious of data and we've got lots of data within the organisation. Um, I think like anything, that data can help us to communicate what's going on in the business. It can help us communicate why decisions were made and support those decisions. 
and it can also provide stakeholders, whether they're internal stakeholders or, or maybe some external, you know, even governance stakeholders, it can provide them insights into how our business is operating, where it's operating, particularly, you know, in, in our case where we do, do operate across such a diverse geographical um, sort of remit. So I, I think it supports rather than sort of, um, yep. you know, is, is being demanded. It's, it's, it's a tool that we can use to support support yep. our business and support the people on the ground. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. And actually a question that's come in from Stephanie uh, from the audience uh, is, is a good one um, and, and love some feedback on that. You know, do shareholders generally have the knowledge to be able to interpret the data uh, and, and, you know, we can give them all the info in the world, but they may not have to use it correctly. I guess that's an interesting point if you've got, um, you know, investors or shareholders that, that are potentially not that close to the ground. Um, Dan, I see you, you're nodding your head there. You might have some, some views on that one. Well, I think it's, you know, the, the three guys on this panel's job to, to deliver that data in a usable way. Um, you know, our investors all give us the ultimate compliment of being asset managers and, and farm managers. And, you know, with two of our core principles at Gun Agri are alignment and transparency. And, you know, our big belief is, you know, give them the information in a usable way. And if they ask for more information, give it to them. Uh, and that for us builds a very aligned um, relationship with those shareholders. And we're, we're probably a bit more you know, different to, to say Macquarie, who obviously I know pretty well, you know, in our, in our cattle strategy, there's ultimately sort of, you know, a handful of core investors and then some smaller ones. So managing those information requests is a lot easier than a fund with, you know, 70 or 80 investors. So I, I do appreciate there's a, there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. But just, just touching on one of the things Anthony said, <clears throat> Tech is great and data is great, but it's all for us has to be a cost benefit analysis. You know, what does the te tech provide? What does, um, you know, cameras provide? Is there, is the benefit outweighing the cost? Uh, and, and who is that? Who is the benefit going to? And the other point, which again has been touched on by both the guys is around, um, you know, getting buy-in from, from your operational team, like, you know, the head office or we call it the support office coming up with some great tech tech solution. If the guys on the ground think it's rubbish, it's, it's never going to work. So you need them to be part of the um, due diligence process on, on assessing it, on implementing it, um, you know, looking at different varieties as, you know, there's very few bits of tech that there's only one solution. Sorry, my Siri keeps coming on, which is tech and tech being annoying. Apple's listening to us. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I think that's also a key element, which it sounds like both Bill and Anthony, are, you know, are dealing with firsthand and certainly at Gun Agri. For us, it's, you know, from the, from the farm manager up, they, they, they need to be involved in, you know, moving tech providers or, or solutions. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. I mean, it's a, it's a big piece there around, you know, in making sure all stakeholders are actually engaged in the process, they actually see the why of, of where, you know, the, the, the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve. But, you know, if there's a tool that's that's trying to be implemented or forced from one angle, whether that be from bottom up, um, from the farm manager perspective up or from the top down, uh, and everyone doesn't see value in that, um, then there's no point. That's one thing that, that we're really focused on in when we're, you know, running implementations is making sure that everyone across that business uh, is not only engaged, but but is excited and sees the benefits for them. And of course, the benefits can be very different for people at the various levels, whether you're, you know, a Jack or a Jillaroo, whether you're a manager or, or whether you are, um, you know, in a support office dealing with, with more of the insights. The other interesting point you made there, Dan, was, was around, um, you know, was around the data and the information. It's, it's all very well to have, you know, a whole stack and suite uh, of, of data collected or information sitting there, but if you're not doing something with it and driving an insight, well, well what's the point? So whether you're trying to drive the, that, those insights into the ultimate own, owners or shareholders, or whether you're trying to make a decision as a, as a farm manager around you know, what's performing and what's not, and whether it's an individual animal that's, that's a high performer or low performer, uh, it's all very well to collect some data, but you need to be able to have that in a way that can actually help make a decision uh, and, and drive that business forward. So, 
And Dan, in terms of that cost-benefit analysis, I, go, I guess a little bit of a background back step on that is you know, you've had some amazing and impressive growth results recently to an article about a nearly 9% growth of the fund um, to 225 Aussie um, dollars. How do, you, how do you think about investing for the future and um, where you're going to make your investments going forward to continue that growth and, and amazing performance you've had at Canagri? Thanks. Um, Thank you. Uh, we, when we set up in 2013, we, we you know, consider ourselves a farm management business with asset management capability, given our backgrounds. You know, our chairman, Bill Gunn, is a fifth generation farmer. Um, Alan Hoppy, our CEO, has been running farms for other people for, for 40 years. This is his fourth farm management business he set two up for Macquarie. Um, you know, we're all heavily involved in some big institutional strategies like Lawson Grains and the Crop Fund. Um, but in terms of you know verticals or strategies, we always liked um, grass-fed protein production, um, you know, rain-fed row cropping, um, and also permanent crops and water. One thing that we've always done and will continue to do is is have a development angle. We do believe there's some really good value creation from you know rolling your sleeves up and 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 doing the work. You know we're, we're you know an advocate of building a portfolio versus buying a portfolio. Um, and, you know, sort of, so we, we are in the process of developing out those, you know, um, mixed farms or row cropping strategies and the permanent crop and water stuff. Uh, and, and really from day one or, you know, day minus 365, strategy design, portfolio construction, asset aggregation, asset evaluation, and then operations. There's a layer of technology involved in every one of those, which again, this is not disrespectful to the aging farming population that may or may not be on this call, but um, you know, not everyone's doing it. And I think as the asset class becomes more institutionalized, um, that is one of the, the value creations that, that the likes of the three organizations on this panel should be bringing to the table. There's obviously a, an additional overhead of having a corporate um, structure on top of the, the farm unit. So there has to be some benefits and, and doing things more efficiently and, and having the scale to validate the investment in tech, we think is, is, is paramount to that. Doing everything the exact same as your 75 year old dad over a million acres is crazy. Like it's, you know, it should be, if that's your approach, you should leave it in, in the family, in a family farmer uh, structure. So, and again, that all tech is a big part of that. And, you know, a small, one farm operator probably can't validate, you know, using the level of tech, whether it's in, in evaluating assets or operating assets that someone who's managing a big portfolio can. Yeah, and actually that's, that's a, really, a really interesting topic and, and often it's not um, an aversion to technology. It's not, you know, I don't believe in it. It's, it's often around change management and, you know, you mentioned yourself, um, you know, your dad didn't even have a smartphone. So it's, it's thinking that it's, it's too much of a barrier to get into. Uh, we can't adopt it. You know, it's too hard. Uh, and I just don't even want to look at it. Um, and, and I guess that brings us to the topic around, you know, around change management uh, and, and around, you know, what that looks like. And, and we see that, you know, day in, day out, you know, as, as we onboard, you know, 100, 100 odd farming organisations every month here, we need to try and work out how we do that in a, in a scalable way as well. Um, but Bill, from, from your perspective, um, you know, what, what's the, you know, I guess when, when we think about technology at AgriWeb, it's only part of the picture, right? It's, it's great to have this solution, but you've got to get it implemented and trained. You've got to get people using it, believing in it. Um, so there's a big kind of change management training and process component to that. Um, how do you think about that in, internally? Um, and, and I guess obviously, you know, we're working with, with you guys on some of that. Um, how, do you, how do you work through that internally? Um, well, it has to start with the problem. Um, it has to start with a really comprehensive, thorough understanding of what it is that you're trying to solve. Because it might not be a technology answer in the first place. But it's, it's really easy to latch on to the, you know, something shiny and something that looks like it would be a great idea to implement and say, let's go and add this into this business, but it's really the wrong way around. Well, there's, there's the odd circumstance where it's just really obvious, but it's usually fairly rare. Um, technology needs to be the last step in a process of understanding the problem, 
working with the people in the business to understand what the perfect solution looks like and then putting the te technology together to support that sort of ultimate goal. Um, and in this business, it's about doing it in the broader scheme of all the different opportunities we have. So what we're learning in poultry can be applied to the problems we're identifying in, say, the cattle side of things. Now, an example might be um, the work that we're doing in counting and weighing and behaviour analysis and that sort of thing. There's, there's a lot of data in poultry and a lot of methodology there that we can learn from and bring to the table when we're trying to solve the problems that we're identifying in these other businesses. Um, but it always has to start with the people doing the work. And, and that way, by the time you end up with a solution, you, you've worked with them from day zero right through to when you're actually delivering it. They've been a part of the experience. They've got ownership of what's being delivered. It's not always the way it goes, but it is always the way that we need to try to do it. Um, it's how you get the best outcome. It's how you're going to get something that's really fit for purpose and suits what the businesses really need. Um, I think software in particular um, over the last few years, I, it, it's changed where if uh, my opinion on it is if you, if you have a problem with the, the software, it's with the software, it's not with the user. Um, and it's as far as implementing a system like AgriWeb, as you mentioned, which we're doing across three aggregations at the moment, um, it's, it's, everyone's expecting with a system like this that it'd be some enormous complicated thing. Um, that's not what good software these days actually is. Uh, good software is the kind of thing you should be able to pick up and play around with it and figure out how it works. And that's exactly what AgriWeb does. It's really non-threatening and it does meet those problems that we identified and the, the solutions that um, we identified as you know, opportunities really early on and worked with the managers of these businesses in making sure that it was going to be a good fit. And it sort of links back to that initial problem as well of, okay, so we've got all these immediate things that we're trying to solve, things like task management and inventory. Um, but we've also got much longer term things. So how do we incorporate the sensor data that I was mentioning before, or how do we take advantage of these opportunities around satellite biomass assessment, which is a satellite image and they process the image to work out how much feed you have left in your paddock. And it sounds you know, pretty out there, but it's actually very accurate, um, very exciting. So you get this update every five days. So, so we need to address the immediate, we need to think about those long-term things, but we need to take everyone on the journey um, as well. That's how we're gonna get the best result. And Bill, on that front, you know, we increasingly see we've been in discussions with some great education groups across Australia and you know, multiple different states and schools and universities about the element of kind of certification in technology on farm and in the agricultural space. We've seen it on resumes and CVs across the country when people are advertising on Facebook for new roles, they'll often see a, an AgWorld certified or an AgriWeb certified. How do you, um, how are your colleagues taking at AAM to learning that new skill? Is it, is it something that they're really investing in for the future, do you think? Oh, for sure. So as far as adoption um, on, the, on, the agriculture, on, the, on the cattle and sheep and, and cropping properties, we're very lucky because the people, you know, colleagues on those properties, they, they're used to figuring things out for themselves. They're used to um, trying new things all the time. Um, they seem to have a real natural interest in it pretty well across the board. So implementing software or any sort of technology into those, I think we're, we're very lucky, but we have to be careful not to take advantage of that. Um, yeah. And we have to make sure that they're, you know, well looked after and well supported. Um, and as far as certifications go, yeah, that's absolutely another really important side of things like professional development is something that's taken very seriously in, you know, in a building like this with, with lawyers and engineers and, uh, directors of companies and there is a great opportunity to put more structure around the development of the skills uh, on the properties uh, on these businesses um, and to that end there's something we're working on at the moment is a, a learning management system so that training like AgriWeb can be incorporated into that but as well as all the other training that goes on um, a lot of it's informal um, a lot of it can be formalized and structured so that we can better record what's going on and so that people build up their, their CVs so, so that they have a really good record of what they've achieved. Um, 
and I think yeah, there, there's a there's a lot that happens that isn't um, necessarily captured, and that's something that we're really keen to work more on. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on it in just a second um, when we talk about with you, Anthony. But in, Dan, in the interim, it, it always it's the chicken and egg, right? We go through a training program and we'll go through the sessions. It might be five, ten, it might be every month or every week. Um, but it's about the why. You know, how have you got uh, an implementation internally from a technology perspective? And how are you taking colleagues on that journey to learn the new skill? We all know data graveyards exist. We've seen them in every industry and job that, that's ever been around. How are you finding the, the implementation of the why um, for your guys? I guess, yeah, I guess that goes back to sort of your initial, um, you know, to date we, we, we own and operate every asset. So um, I was just trying to work out what the average age of, you know, the, the vendors who have sold to us, and it, I reckon it starts with a seven, not a six, to give you some perspective. Um, so we've always bought in our own manager. Um, you know, we've always got a pretty good back catalogue of, of people interested in working with us. Um, some of the best forms of, 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 of sourcing talent is, is, you know, through, you know, a positive uh, news article in, you know, Beef Central or, you know, AFR or something like that. Um, and, and you know very quickly when you're speaking to someone and we've got a um, HR manager who, who only works part-time with us because we don't have a full-time job, but she's previously worked in some big organisations, one of them maybe on this panel, for example. <laughs> um, so she's very good at, you know, filtering um, talent and, and, you know, you know very quickly if someone who's going to be a manager or two IC, a stock hand, um, you know, whatever the role is, if they want to learn, and that for us is the key question. It's not, do they know it? Do they want to learn? And if they want to learn, that's a really exciting person to, to, to bring onto the team. Um, you know, the comment, oh, that, you know, the throwaway comment that uh, it's a waste of time, which gets used unfortunately too much, is a big red flag for us. Um, and there are, you know, there are different buckets of, of, of technology use. There are some which are non-negotiable, like anything around work, work health and safety, um, you know, we're, we're big advocates of using Global Gap, which is, which is administrative and, and there's a cost, which Global Gap is good agricultural practices, um, where each farm gets effectively operationally audited. And, you know, there, that's a process and, and you need the managers to buy into that. And that's an, that's an additional piece of work that historically they wouldn't have ever done. Um, but on the flip side, and, and I think Bill really kind of, um, discussed it quite eloquently was you also want to provide an avenue for growth in these people where, you know, if they've worked for uh, a wealthy guy who lives in Brisbane or Rockhampton for, you know, 15 years, they're not investing in, you know, improving their skills. All, all they want is to produce results on that farm and, and to provide, you know, internal and external training, whether it's technical stuff like, you know, fodder budgets, uh, whether it's external stuff like, you know, manager meetings where you get in, you know, someone like you guys to come and do a present presentation on, you know, forecasting and, uh, 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 or, you know, an external body like Mercado or someone um, that they, they historically don't get access to that level of sort of um, personal improvement. And I think that's a really big positive that coming into a bigger organisation can happen. It also means they can outgrow their role and I think you, we all need to be comfortable that, you know, that's the evolution of people. You can't put someone in a role and improve them and then get disappointed after 10 years or eight years, they, they go and take a bigger role somewhere else or if there's not a bigger role for them in your own organisation. And I think that's just being a responsible steward of, of young agricultural talent, which, I'm, you know, I, I think we all, all should be. And that's, that's part of something that I'm sure, you know, that the panellists all, all think about as well. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. You know, a lot of times we speak about, you know, the the kind of pressures and requirements on the agricultural industry to, you know, feed a, a population of 9 billion people to do more with less, uh, you know, with the pressures of climate change, um, carbon, consumer demands, all those types of things. And it's really easy to kind of throw around, um, you know, being a technology company saying, oh, well, technology is the answer. Uh, you know, of course, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle, but we can't forget about the people. Um, and actually, if, if the people and the generations coming through aren't upskilling themselves, 
and aren't you know really learning what the future of agriculture is going to be like then we're really going to struggle as an industry to get there um and those individuals just just also won't succeed so i think that that's you know a really key piece to this and a, and a key message that that we want to get out to the community and, and we see a big shift right of, of a generational shift of people coming back to whether it be the family farm or, or into a larger organization, um, the larger organizations which we're talking about now, uh, they've, they've gone and done something else. They've, they've had a look at something else and they've come back to the, to, to the industry and thought, well, actually, there's many ways we can do this better. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here and, and let's make some change. Um, and change, you know, doesn't need to be around technology. Um, but, you know, for the bulk of it, if we're not going to start making some changes, that the industry is not going to get to where it needs to get to. That's just a fact. Um, and, and Anthony, look, you know, obviously, you know, the, your 27 stations and, and, you know, close to your 5 million hectares rolling out an implementation across, um, a, across you know, your business, uh, whether it be AgriWeb or some other uh, technology or initiative or change management process, uh, how do you go about doing that on, on such a large scale? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's always an interesting challenge. And uh, I guess the key thing I would highlight to start with, and, and I think Bill and Dan have touched on it, is there's, there's almost the technology element of the change. Um, that's one part of it. And, and often, you know, across any business, but particularly a, a large agricultural business, there's the business process side of that change as well. So, you know, as I think Bill touched on it, if the, if the software is written well, it's developed well, it's, it's a wide ranging platform, almost the, the technology piece is the, you know, sometimes the easier piece. And, and then it's the, the change to business process that, that tends to just throw the most complication in. Um, but, but, you know, training, I guess, facilitates that rollout. And, and I think it's, you know, incredibly important from, from the most junior of roles to, to even, you know, the most senior of roles, the CEOs and, and even the directors, that, that training aspect is important. Um, and, you know, certainly from our perspective, we're, we're a lot more conscious of training these days. Um, uh, I think Dan touched on in the past, you might have thrown out a technology solution and, and, you know, the nature of our workforce is they'd sort of work it out and work how to work out how to do it. Um, but, you know, now we're, we're certainly dedicating a, a lot more time and resources to training and ensuring people get, get the right training, um, both around the technology, but, but also the, the implications for business process change, because that's typically where we can drive some of our efficiencies. And also, in part, the, the most effective change within our business is, is using technology to improve business process. So it's sort of those those two pieces coming together, um, and and I guess there's, um, you know, the uh, there's no point providing just generic technology training without focusing on, you know, specific training for for our business processes. Um, they're, they're just as important to each other, and and yeah, I guess the. The key for us is bring when we talked about bringing people on the journey before train, training is part of bringing those people on the journey and making sure that they understand the underlying business processes and also how it impacts other parts of the business because if we link it back to the communication piece if, if they understand the why which, which i think you touched on before it, it also helps it be more effective and, and so it's all part of that training education um, embedding that you know bigger than self sort of thing, like how you fit into the organization and where all these little steps actually contribute to a much bigger, um, a much bigger part of the organization as a whole. Yeah. And look, it wouldn't be 2020 without uh, bringing this up at some point in the, in the 90 minutes, but obviously there's in recent times and, and pandemics and, and COVID-19, We've certainly seen a big shift at AgriWeb in the way that we can deliver training, the way we can bring audiences together to discuss important topics like today. Um, has that recent you know, pandemic and move to virtual conferencing, be it Teams, Zoom, whatever the product is, do you see that as something that's impacted the way you're able to deliver that training? Uh, absolutely. And I think um, obviously today is a case in point, isn't it? Um, I think probably typically, you know, a lot of training used to be done on the ground, um, in person, in that sort of, you know, whether it's in the rec club or in a classroom setting, um, even that sort of the, you know, a field day type 
type mm. thing. And, and obviously I think the last six months is it's forced us to, to adopt faster than probably what we, what we may have naturally. Um, it's forced us to, and it's forced our people to, to take on these new technologies, which I guess from a technologist point of view has, has been a fantastic thing because it's, it's enabled us to, to keep that interaction up, um, to keep that interaction up from a, from a training perspective, but also just having a dispersed workforce, you know, an isolated workforce, you know, using these technologies in that, in that way. Um, so we've, you know, I guess we've seen it as a huge advantage that um, these Zoom teams, Skype, are, are available to us. And I think probably we've, we've noticed that um, it's enabled us to do things faster um, and also to be more nimble um, when we are trying to deploy technology, when we are trying to train people, even when we're just trying to address issues. Um, you can wrap that all together and instead of waiting you know, to next week, instead of waiting for a phone call, we, we now have a much richer presentation of that training, a much richer um, interaction between our people. And it also allows us to get, get experts in front of our people faster. So it allows us to, to address those issues or um, also complete that feedback loop as to how do we want things to work on the ground? What are those requirements? We can easily get or more easily get all the right people you know, around that virtual, virtual table together. Whereas, you know, potentially prior to pandemic and, and prior to, to certainly the, the more widespread use of these technologies, you know, it, it just took longer. Um, so for, for me, it's the speed and the nimbleness that, that are the huge advantage for our business and, and see us pushing things forward probably faster than, than we would have been able to in the past. Yeah, brilliant, and certainly something that's probably here to stay for the for the foreseeable future. Now, a question that's come in, um, a good one from Ben uh, over at Hewitt Cattle. Welcome, Ben. Thank you for joining. Uh, a question here is within the platform, so within within the Agro platform, how easily can head office or higher manage, management access and analyze KPI performance data across multiple assets? Um, and I guess so. That's one part to the question, and the second part is. Uh, has it assisted with end of month processing as an example? Um, so I'll open that to the floor to, to whoever wants to, to take a stab at that. So I'm not, so I'm not leading you down a garden path. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tick off the end of month uh, question. I suspect the first part is probably one you could answer, John, better than I could. But the end of month, uh, since we've used AgriWeb, has certainly been a much more streamlined, uh, tighter controlled mechanism than the system we are using before. Um, and that was ultimately the main driver of us using AgriWeb was because of the, 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 you know, when you've got assets such as ours, which are up in the Gulf, you know, two assets bigger than a million acres with, you know, 20 plus thousand head of cattle on them. Um, you know, you need timely numbers and you need stock control on a per paddock basis. And, you know, if it's being done manually or even with Excel, it's pretty clunky and there's a lot of, human touch involved in that process. And every time a human touches a spreadsheet or a data point, something can effectively be incorrectly used. So, um, and again, it was, it was an interesting process. Um, you know, I, I, I saw AgriWeb as a, as a great solution. Um, we then got involved, our sort of regional manager and, and, and ultimately the, the farm managers to, to buy into it. And, and they were ultimately the deciders of, of, of using the process. And, you know, for us, it's more around, and this is, a, is an interesting topic, like tech is not only about improving performance or improving productivity or improving, you know, it's also about improving uh, controls. And, you know, when you have investors on the other side of the planet, as I presume everyone on this panel does, um, you know, we, we are effectively, you know, stewards of their, of their capital. And we, we, as directors of these businesses, have to be able to, you know, have assurances around um, stock controls and, and animals walk around and they die and they can walk through fences and they can be put on the back of a truck. So you, you really, we think it's a, a really big positive and it's, and it's reduced our end of month accounting process down to, you know, we, we, we get our numbers out in five days now, which is not entirely AgriWeb's um, due to AgriWeb, but it's a, it's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. It's something that 
AgriWeb lets you do is, and something that we're striving towards is eliminate this concept of needing to catch up at the end of the month. Right? Because it's a system that captures everything, that's the idea, and that's what we're heading towards. Um, and it's capturing things live and it's all going to the cloud live. It's all on the one system. If all that information is accurate and if the reporting is automatic, the idea is that you can generate those reports whenever you like um, with no big catch up at the end of the month. Um, you'd still need to have a, a process of making sure that everything is up to date, but that's really all it is. It's a, it's a reconciling activity um, more so than catching up so that you can get those reports through on time which is great for everyone because it cuts down on duplication, you know, using spreadsheets and filling out paper forms and then having someone type that into another system. Um, the, yeah, the power of it is making it a better experience for the people who can spend, you know, more of their time actually doing what they want to do and what they're there to do and less time on, you know, handling paperwork. Um, and it's better for visibility on the investor and executive level as well because um, they can call this information up whenever they like. So with AgriWeb, jump in. Um, you know, there might be 30 or 40 different types of reports and all sorts of dashboards. Um, uh, they can access any bit of information that they want without having to ask for it. And it's all very easy to use. So um, the reporting side of things, I think, is one of the most powerful parts of the program. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, I think um, we hope and we're finding that's it's key to keep, we're trying to reduce the amount of time that our people spend in the office on the ground. And so it's that ongoing, you know, if the, the ins and outs, the, the sales and purchases and the debts, if, if we can, you know, manage and maintain that data on an ongoing basis and not have to be in the office crunching Excel spreadsheets, um, you know, for us, that's a win. We, we want to reduce the amount of admin, reduce the amount of time that that our station managers are, are stuck at a desk. So it's really important for us to try and deliver those efficiencies for them so that they can be out doing, you know, higher value activities rather than uh, end of month processing sort of thing. No, all, all very valid points and, and valuable insights. So, so appreciate that. One thing that, that um, sparked me there is we've spoken a lot about um, insights and risk mitigation and accountability on, on data and information. Um, from a business perspective, uh, one area we haven't spoken about is is really on the audit and compliance side of things. Uh, and you know, we we know that we're in a world now where those requirements are only continuing to increase as the consumer demands that, and it, and it just comes down the value chain ultimately back to the farm gate. Um, and and you know, this might be from you know the simple LPA audits, or if you're on the pasture certified or, or organic schemes. Um, you know, having that information available and, and not just around, you know, the auditor might roll down the front gate, but more, you know, from your brand and from your corporate risk perspective, having that peace of mind. Uh, is that something that plays into to what you guys think about as well? Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, this is one of those examples where um, using a system like AgriWeb, it, it sort of takes the other approach instead of identifying a problem and building a solution to fit the problem exactly. You've got a solution that's there that you can apply to your business and you know that all the boxes are being ticked, all the protocols are being addressed. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's a very handy piece of functionality where you have those legislative requirements um, and, and other sorts of um, requirements that are more or less imposed on the business it is very useful to have that functionality built into the same system. Yeah, great. And for Dan or Anthony, anything on the, the compliance side for you guys? Um, yeah, I, I, not really a lot to add other than, you know, an audit, whether it's an operational audit for a global gap certification, we, we don't have any organic or, or sort of branded product. We, we sell at farm gate and, uh, our, our livestock can, you know, go in multiple directions. Um, but, you know, anything that involves an audit, a robust process, which isn't manually driven, gives an auditor, you know, a lot of confidence and comfort. And, and that can be a very seamless um, part of part of that, you know, financial solution or, or operational or compliance solution, as you say. So, um, you know, we, we've got a risk and audit committee. And one of the things we, we look at is, you know, how robust is the stock control mechanism? 
Um, and AgriWeb is, you know, is part of that, you know, heightened stock control mechanism. So, yeah, I, I would say it's it's if you've got a stronger stronger box where where the where the process is done, it's it's an easy one for an external party, whether it's you know a board of directors or 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 you know an EY who's doing your audit of financial statements to get comfortable. And you know, again, with these larger corporate enterprises with investors offshore, you you have to be able to provide and sign off on. On, on, on numbers going into these financial statements. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe the only other thing I'd add is uh, I think for, for any business, you know, the more you can get out of crunching data in Excel and the more you can bring that level of integrity to your data within a system so that it is, again, transparent to whether it is your auditors, whether it is your, your management teams, um, or your board of directors, you know, it's that level of integrity and getting out of the manual process that, that is inherently embedded within running a business out of Excel, um, you know, that, that can only lead to improvements. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. Dan, well, hopefully we're making some progress from the Arthur Anderson days of uh, <laughs> those wonderful audit month ends. I know I'm, I, for one, have been scarred for life from, from, uh, from those sessions. Um, so moving on, a uh, question, I think, let me just pull that to, um, just on, the, on taking a bit of a step back from the, the technology itself, we've got a question in from Mark on uh, connectivity. Um, connectivity is a key enabler for IoT and improvements, obviously, when compared to other industries, um, rail, mining, etc. Um, how do others justify the funding or do you seek partnerships with other agribusiness and government as many cannot justify it alone. I guess this is in relation to some of the properties um, further north in the Territory and, and in Queensland. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to jump in for a quick response. Um, again, not wanting you know, to sit here and just bang AgriWeb's drum, but one of the appealing things about uh, the AgriWeb, because there is no Wi-Fi on you know, a farm in the middle of the Gulf, and frankly, I don't think that's you know, coming anytime soon. So you need a handheld device that will bounce data up and be captured and updated whenever, you know, the, the phone or, or, or iPad or whatever the, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the yard side data collection point is. Uh, and that's, that's what you guys have done. And, and that was one of the really appealing things. You know, when we took over some of these properties, um, some of the processes were, you know, pretty, Pretty rudimentary, like taking photos of handwritten, um, you know, stock numbers, and then that was that data was input, you know, in another office, and you know, we very quickly <laughs> recognised that that wasn't a very secure process. Um, so, you also, I guess, the point is rather than try and, you know, obviously, we would all love, you know, my parents don't even live that far out of out of a town, but you know, that, their big bugbear continues to be we don't have Wi-Fi, and um, if my dad doesn't have a phone, I think he's just listen to Alan Jones too, too much. Um, <laughs> and um, so then there's some different solutions to the problem, I guess, is the point. And AgriWeb has recognised that we can't build something that has to be uh, online because it just removes, you know, 85% of um, farms in Australia's ability to use that data or that, that service. Um, but, you know, hopefully, and we've all been to enough, you know, ag tech conferences that there, there are some really interesting solutions for, for improving um, you know, the Wi-Fi and connectivity in these regional centres. I think as a business operator, it's too hard to wait around for, for, for that solution. And we've certainly gone down the path of finding a solution that you know, is not real time, but it's pretty close to real time uh, in terms of you, know, you go from crush side to, to, the, to the homestead and the homestead has a antenna and the data gets pinged up and it's, it's sitting in my email or, or, or my, um, agri web platform the next morning so there's no there's no sort of vulnerability of the data being overridden in that period because there's only usually one or two people on farm who are actually inputting the data i think maybe to add to that connectivity um it, it's an investment case similar to, to any other part of technology or any other part of the development on farm um, look at what the requirements are for that connectivity, what the benefit is that that connectivity delivers at a particular point to the business. Um, and, and then obviously what the cost is, but similar to Dan, if you know, there's connectivity at most of the homestead complexes, 
Um, I guess in, in AgriWeb specific case, you can do what you need to in the paddock. And then once you come back within that connectivity zone, the, the data goes back up into the, the AgriWeb cloud. So um, it, in terms of specific connectivity at, at particular points, we, we would still treat it as any other investment case of, you know, what's the requirement to get connectivity to a specific set of yards, a specific watering point um, or, or a piece of infrastructure, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, before, before we sort of go about it, so. Yeah, sure. No, I think there's some exciting times uh, ahead with um, Mr. Musk and Tesla and batteries and, and the way the world is going from a lack of connectivity in certain areas. There's definitely some, some hardware in there as well that's coming down the line, which is very exciting. Um, just to come back to a, another question from, um, for Dan, sorry, from Douglas. A topical data problem and indeed an opportunity is the current state of the water market and its influence on agriculture. Solid data can be difficult to get and regulations are changing. Are water markets a consideration to the investment decision making process? Uh, absolutely. Uh, obviously, specific to uh, permanent crops in the Murray Darling Basin system is, you know, any sort of development is nearly 50% uh, of water acquisition, depending on your risk profile of, of what you want your, your, your water solution to be. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of um, people have gone and planted almonds or you know, planted thirsty crops in inverted commas, who have assumed that, you know, they can rent water at two or 3% of its you know, value for 20 years. And that, that kicks out the best IRR and, you know, you go through a severe drought that we've just done over the last three years and, you know, the cost of water is 20 or 30% of the value of that water. So it just destroys the model. Um, you know, our investor base are all very conservative, institutional, um, predominantly pension funds, endowments or philanthropic organisations and would happily give up one or 2% of, of IRRs to have, you know, some more secure access to water. Um, that being said, I think the, the, the permanent crop space um, and the debate about water does focus a lot on uh, obviously the Murray-Darling Basin system as it should, because it's, it's the biggest system in Australia. And I'd actually think, say that it's one of the better managed systems because they have decoupled water from land and deregulated it. And it's now, um, it's a market mechanism. But I think for us, there's a lot of really interesting opportunities outside of that system where water's not so, you know, <laughs> terrifyingly expensive um, but you know we certainly wouldn't be going into the the Murray system anytime soon to buy water um, you know we're all hopeful I'm sure on this call of the El Nino uh, La Nina uh, coming into effect I think as of two days ago uh, if we've got two or three years of above average rainfall a lot of those um, dams should fill up and you know you should see some some costing of, of water coming back a bit so but you know I guess the, the key point is, yes, it absolutely is a consideration. Um, but there is, you know, water is not a, you know, homogenous product. There's mm. high security, high reliability, and they mean different things depending on what side of the Murray you're on. There's water, you know, in northern New South Wales, there's water around Bundaberg, which has now got some, some challenges uh, with the Paradise Dam issue. Um, you know, Tasmania has some, some great access to water. So, you know, people look at the headline numbers and go, wow, $6,000 a meg or $9,000 a meg is, is hard to make work. But again, it's, it's, it's assessed on, on where it's needed and, and, you know, there are different opportunities, I guess, and different water, water markets to, to consider. Yep. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that, Dan. So just switching gear, we've, we've sort of talked about the, you know, the ROI side of things, the return on investment uh, throughout the discussion already. Um, it'd be great to address some of that and, and Anthony, you know, just handing it over to you in terms of, you know, I guess looking at technology, is this something that you just believe um, or your organisation believes is, is critical to growth and, and just has to happen for some of the reasons we've spoken about today? Um, or when you're assessing it, uh, you know, are you sitting in a spreadsheet trying to crunch the, the ROI on that? Um, and how do you go about doing that? It's something that, that comes across our desk pretty, pretty regularly in terms of, of, of trying to assess that ROI. Yeah, so, so absolutely, technology fundamental to growth um, and it is a necessity, um, but I still think there's an element of diligence that, that goes into 
you know, investing in technology. So we, we would typically, I guess, well, I would typically look at it from two different lenses. There's the, the ongoing investment required just to, to keep the lights on, to manage and maintain the business and to leverage technology on an ongoing basis um, in the same way that, you know, we need a land cruiser to, to conduct our business. There's an element of technology that, you know, whether you're the milk bar on the, on the corner and you're the local shop or whether you're a, a corporate agriculture player, technology is an absolute necessity and there's an element of investment that's required to, to keep the lights on. I think then there's the other side where, you know, I touched on before, there's technologies like any other development on farm. It, there is an ROI involved in that process, um, looking at, you know, what are the potential benefits that will be delivered, um, whether it's a, a cost saving or, or a revenue driver, um, and, and obviously what, what level of investment is, is required to deliver that. So I, I still think that's, uh, you know, certainly something we go through and, and assess um, for, for any capital investment, including technology. So, but we definitely differentiate between that sort of, yeah, business as usual versus the, the, the sort of bigger one-off developments as such. Um, and I guess I, I think Dan and Bill have touched on it. Uh, you know, there's still uncertainty where we're coming out of drought. We're, we're still very conscious of, you know, how we deploy our capital and that and how we and how we invest in technology is just how we're deploying our investors' capital as well. So we, we're still very stringent and, and diligent around how we go about that. Yeah, understood. I think there's, there's not a company in the world at the moment that isn't isn't uh, incredibly diligent with capital employed. And talking of capital employed, uh, Bill, um, we've talked a lot about the incredible opportunity, you know, for a turn on that in the ag industry. Um, for what your team is pioneering at AAM in terms of investment, how have you? How do you assess the success of those investments um, thus far and into the future? And Anthony's touched on it. You know, is it a is it a business as usual? And we've all been there on investment templates where it's you know money in, money out. What is it? Two years, three years, four years, five years? How are you looking at it from AAM at, at the moment over the, the periods of time? But you know, thus far, what you've done so far, and also into the future as well. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, Dan mentioned it fairly early on around well, everything that we need to do. We do needs to have a, a cost benefit analysis effectively covered. Um, so some of those are much easier than others. Some, some situations there's a very obvious benefit um, and a very clear, strong return. And, and in, in other cases, it's more complex because you might have some infrastructure that's going to facilitate more than one solution. Um, but no matter the project, at least the way that, well, I think probably most, most people handle it. When you're defining a project before you actually engage someone, before you start out, you define what the, and it's a bit of a business buzzword, but I don't mind it, success criteria. Um, so, and you keep track of that throughout the, the project. It's a sort of the North Star or the Southern Cross or whatever it is for making sure that that project is actually going to deliver on what is required to get that return. So anything that we do, um, we make sure that the, the project is staged and that there the success criteria throughout the project and make sure it's being met. So if that cost benefit analysis was initially done properly, if everything was scoped correctly, if the criteria were defined in a way that's measurable and all of those other traits around good criteria, um, you can be assured of a good outcome. Um, if things go off track, you'll know that it's going off track before it's too late. Um, and and you'll, you'll understand what needs to be done to get it back on track. It also gives a lot of clarity for everyone around what it is that we're trying to achieve. Now, are we trying to implement a piece of software because that's just what we feel like doing? Or, or are there really clear objectives that we must meet in order to get that return for our investors on that investment in technology? And does that, does that process you know, mitigate against the need for it to be within a period of time, like a year or 18 months or two years? Does that allow you to be more flexible from a time perspective, would you say? No, I don't think so, because if we're implementing something, it's generally to improve productivity. Um, it's generally to improve some aspect of uh, the performance of the business. And every day that that system isn't implemented is a day that we're losing the opportunity 
to improve that performance and to improve those returns. So uh, sticking to timeframes and uh, uh, sticking to the plan and making sure that everything is delivered on schedule is all part of it because the period is in and of itself part of the return. You know, you don't want to miss those opportunities. It's a, it's a cost. Understood. Um, some uh, great questions coming in thick and fast. Yeah. Um, look, you know, I, th I think this is actually going to be really valuable for the audience. Uh, it was, it was just a comment around, you know, can the three of you touch on some of the technologies you're using on the ground and finding valuable, um, you know, just for the audience to understand what, what you guys are looking at, um, what you're using now, what you're looking at into the future, I think would be, would be really useful. We start at the top. Who, who, who wants to fire off first? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, and I'll sort of talk more broadly about our business rather than just the cattle enterprise. Um, so our mixed farming strategy at the moment, it has a big overlay of um, sustainability, benchmarking and reporting as a commitment to our investor base. And um, so we use a lot of technology and we're partnering with CSIRO um, and developing a bunch of different uh, tools and databases and, and, you know, utilizing a lot of information that's already in the public domain when assessing um, asset acquisitions. Um, and a lot of that is done, you know, from an office and, and, you know, we do a lot of work on our portfolio construction, both looking at the operational productivity potential of an asset, um, which for us is the real, sort of delta of, of making an asset interesting. If, if we think there is some development potential or a mispriced production element on an asset. Um, and we do a lot of that desktop. And, and again, working with CSIRO is, 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 is developing some of those tools, which, which are really quite interesting. You know, and they range from things like telling us where over the last 17 years, you know, um, climate change has had a positive impact and neutral impact um, or a negative impact. Unfortunately, most of Australia is negative. And then, so you're just looking at the severity of the negative. Um, so there's some no-go zones where we, you know, where it's more than a 20% impact over the last 15 to 17 years. There's a few areas where there's a positive impact, which, which we like. And we think that's just a filter that not many managers are, are using. Certainly no, you know, you know by the neighbor um, competitor, which is sort of mostly our competitor. They certainly aren't using things like that. Um, looking at the makeup of a farm, we use a lot of mapping, um, you know, software where you can effectively, you know, look at an asset and, and then, you know, look at the cost of recalibrating that asset, um, which is obviously a big part of any development play. And then ongoing measuring carbon on farm, you know, looking at areas which, which have sort of uh, biodiversity uh, benefits where we can lock it up, um, ecologically significant areas where we can lock it up. Um, and all that is done really from, from the desktop, like you obviously do your DD on, on farm and then you back it up with, with on farm assessment and, and actually going and, you know, digging soil pits and getting soil samples and, and that effectively then builds towards your, your first business plan, um, for, for that asset. So every one of those steps from, you know, desktop analysis to filter, you know, looking at 20 farms down to five farms is all using, um, technology. And then the, 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 you know, the more, you know, sort of mechanical technology, let's call it, of doing DD on farm. And then obviously the operations when you, you know, using big green tractors that they're, they're, they're full of smart equipment now and dragging smart equipment, which again is something that, that you need scale to use. So yeah, that would be sort of start to finish, I guess, um, different layers of technology and happy to dig into yep. any of those if, if wanted. Okay, no, great. Thank you for that. And, and um, Bill, maybe if you could focus on some of the technology you're using, you've mentioned some already, um, and maybe a particular focus on, on what you're implementing on, on property, on station uh, for the audience. Mm, mm, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot going on in that area. So did touch sort of fairly briefly on um, sensors. So the idea of being able to monitor tank levels, bore levels, um, dams, turkeys, nests remotely um, because there's a lot of work and effort going into manually checking and, and, uh, and reporting on that. Weather is another great opportunity. Um, so, so monitoring our weather, like rain, rainfall and humidity, temperature, they all have impacts on performance and opportunities for what we're doing 
on the properties. It's interesting with, with, with a very large area, it's, um, you, you have areas that are large enough for local weather patterns. Um, so one of the things that we're sort of in the early stages of looking at is how we compare um, weather station data with radar data so that we can develop um, a, a more accurate understanding of what's happening on the properties without necessarily needing to install huge amounts of hardware. And mm. uh, then we run into that connectivity issue again, which was raised before. So it's about thinking differently about it and trying to combine um, technology that we have at hand. And one of the benefits of um, sort of the, the mix of what we have is we've got these, these really interesting problems. Um, so, so in poultry, and it won't immediately appear obvious why this is relevant to most of the audience, but it is interesting. Um, we would produce 20 million, I think it's 20 million birds every year, 90 sheds, they're 200 metres by, uh, this is in South Australia, 200 metres by 50 metres or thereabouts, um, 11 farms. Um, so some of the technology that we've got going on there, we have this, um, uh, this, this battery uh, program uh, it's not my area of expertise, um, but the, the basic concept is we're managing electricity prices by installing a lot of solar and a lot of Tesla batteries and feeding that back into the grid. Um, the guys here have developed some software that will trade the market automatically based on fluctuations in prices. And that's with our poultry. Another really fun one with, um, with the chooks is how do we weigh them? It's a, it's a mind bogglingly complex question because you have such large numbers and well, taking any sample, it's always going to be too small um, if you're doing it manually. So um, we need to be re keep a really close touch on the performance of these birds. Um, it can dip really quickly and need to manage it really closely. So, you know, we're looking into options around using video footage and artificial intelligence to analyze the image and give you an estimate on the weight also monitoring the movements of the birds within the sheds um, so that we can understand are they happy chooks because happy chooks are productive chooks and those innovations and, and the projects that are happening there they do translate to to, to cattle and sheep um, you know it's the poultry side of things is incredibly data intensive because the tolerances are so tight um, and, and a lot of what we're learning there can be applied to, to cattle so the idea of weighing cattle with a camera um, is a very interesting one because what we can do then is combine um, video footage with walkover weighing data um, and instead of having walkover weighing in multiple places um, all over a property we can install really cheap cameras process that video footage somewhere else where it's cheap to do so um, and provide real-time insights very cost effectively to the managers of those properties so that they can make um, make those management decisions. There's, uh, there's plenty happening, Bill, uh, in your world, but also in the world of technology and, and innovation. Um, you know, fanciless farming and, and uh, I guess the whole world of IoT, imagery, um, AI, all those types of things, um, you know, is, is really providing an exciting future for agriculture. Um, I guess one thing we always say here at AgriWeb is, is all that sort of stuff will come and it's great, but we've got a lot of fundamentals and core things that we need to solve for first, um, which is, you know, let's get the basics right. Uh, and, and, and I think one of you mentioned before, I think it was you, Dan, you know, we started a place of taking photos of, of um, notes written on a bit of paper for our, for our reporting mechanisms. So, you know, I think that there's a long way for the vast majority of producers in Australia uh, to, to get up to a level of, of you know where we need to be uh, and getting those basics right in a simple and easy way is, is something that that is the first step in, in all of this um, you know before we get too carried away about about all the opportunities that, that may exist one quick question that's come in uh, and, and Dan I'll just quickly ask you on the basis that you mentioned benchmarking um, and it came in from Wayne saying do you ever see Agrib being used as a benchmarking tool for your clients um, and you see it as a, as a powerful way of information to be shared. I mean, this is something that that's on our radar. It's been on our radar for a long period of time. Um, you know, we, we've got over 12 million animals on the on the platform. 
uh, and you know, obviously, an enormous amount of data that's sitting there. Uh, you know, we're very conscious of, of data. Is is you know, the ownership sits with the client, sits with the farmer, um, but there's real value in aggregating that up, in de-identifying that up, so that you know, no one knows who's it, who's it is. But when we package that up and present it back in a way to show you how you're performing against whether it be you know your other properties or your peers or your uh, your region. Um, and also looking at forward projections around markets and how to market your animals and those types of things is something that, that we're really excited to get into. It's a big focus for us moving forward. Um, it sounds like that, that they're sorts of tools that, that you guys would be, would be interested in um, you know, when they're available to be looking at data sets outside of your business and, and how that compares with your business. Yeah, I guess the, the, the simple response is absolutely. And I think... Um, and it's and it's popping up more and more uh, at, at at sort of ag conferences generally and ag tech conferences and the data sharing piece in agriculture as an industry, not just in Australia but globally, has been pretty poor to date. Mm. Um, there is a sense of um, nervousness around sharing data, or whether it's yield data, whether it's production of, of animal performance data. Um, and I think that will change, um, you know, with generational change of, in terms of, you know, as, as more and more farmers become more and more comfortable with the use of technology, the ability to actually share data becomes a lot easier. And, you know, you, you've just referenced it pretty, pretty, pretty well, John, in terms of, you know, having access to, you know, I think you said 12 million animals, um, which is, you know, yeah. half, it's, it's a, you know, if it's, if they're all cattle, that's, you know, half the herd. Um, so suddenly there is a data point that can be relied upon uh, rather than having a requirement of, you know, some government body requesting consensus data to be filled out and, you know, centralised and then redistributed, which, you know, farmers just will never do that. So I think with the use of technology, we allow that benchmarking to happen. Um, and I'm sure farmers from, 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 all size and sort of and levels of, of corporatization will will definitely want to use that and should use that. Yeah, absolutely. So we are coming up on time. Um, maybe we've got time for one more question on your side. Yeah, there. and apologies, guys. We, we we were always a little bit tight on time on the question front. Um, to Bill from Jason, nice and simple. How does individual animal data increase production? because we understand the performance of the individual animals. Um, so we can, we can understand from the time that an animal arrives on a property to the time that the decision needs to be made when it's going or, or what you're doing with it. Um, it, it can inform those decisions. It's a really good example of a data-driven decision. So the example is you're, you're in the yards, you're drafting um, your cattle and you wanna understand which cattle are growing the fastest, which cattle are converting the feed on your property into their weight the best, um, and you can draft them out that way. And it, not just understanding the weights compared to each other, but I mean, that's traditionally how you do it, right? Like you'd say anything under 300 kilos I'm drafting out. But what you can do with AgriWeb is plot the weights over time so that you can see, well, even though this animal is lighter, it's trending um, that it will grow, you know, its, its trend line is showing that it'll end up being a heavier animal than something that's heavier right now. Um, and that's a good example of how using this technology can help you achieve something that you couldn't do, or you could do it, but it would be a bit of a mission. You'd, you'd be using Excel and it wouldn't be particularly fun. This individual animal management side of things just shows you, I've seen the, in the beta side of things, nice little graph, here's the line, this is where they're gonna be in three or four months time. It gets back to the point we made before. It's all great to be collecting information if it's a data graveyard and no one's looking at it or being able to make a decision, what's the point? So it's got to be exposed in a way that, that's actionable and you can make a decision that, that, that's meaningful. Um, so gentlemen, look, we're, we're one minute on time. I'd love to go around the room, a quick 30 seconds from each of you, uh, one piece of, of advice for anyone listening in, uh, thinking about you know, adopting technology, thinking about how do we take that first step. Uh, round Robin, Anthony, I will start with you. Thanks, John. Um, 
Yeah, if I was my piece of advice, I think you touched on it before. Keep keep it simple and get the basics right. And once you get that that platform, um, you can then build and become more and more sophisticated as you go. But the, the absolute key for, for whatever livestock business you're in and whichever geography for, for me is getting the, getting the basics right and doing them well rather than trying to be broad and do a million different things in a million different ways and, and probably do them poorly. Um, do, do each little piece and do it well, get it right, and then move to the next one. Brilliant. Thank you, Anthony. Start simple, get it right, and move to the next one. Bill, what's your parting words of wisdom? Uh, it depends on the size of what you're doing, I think. Like if, if it's a small operation, just jump into it um, because you're very nimble and you can, you can try it and you can fail and you can try again. Um, if, if, if it's a larger sort of situation and there's more at stake, listen to the users, listen to the people who are going to be using it and use that as the starting point. Brilliant. Brilliant piece of advice there. Thank you, Bill. And Dan? Yeah, I agree with both those comments. Um, I guess my one would be, you know, work out what salute, what's the problem you're trying to solve for, step one. Um, look at the solutions and don't chase something with too many sparkly things. Like, just remember what the problem is you're trying to solve as a starting point. Uh, and shop it around. Like, you know, AgriWeb case in point, they will give you a ton of training to, to get you to use and, and actually um, be a useful user of that system. There's, there's no point going into a store and buying a, you know, a box of technology that then just sits on your, on your um, you know, in your, in your office for the next six years and never gets used. It, it needs to be functional. And most, uh, you know, software as a solution providers will give you as much training as you need to get up the curve and, and don't be afraid to be educated. That would be my, would be my advice. Yeah, brilliant. Sort of great, great quick pieces of advice across the board there in terms of starting simple, get the basics right, understand the problems, make sure you're trained up, make sure it's implemented so it actually gets used uh, and engage all the stakeholders in that process uh, to make sure that that solution's rolled out and adding value to the business because if it's not, uh, there's no point to it. Um, so look, love to, uh, you know, quick, quick, um, you know, around the hall. Thank you so much, Dan, Bill uh, and Anthony for, for joining. Uh, it's been a great session. Uh, you know, we've had, we've had a, a huge audience um, to come and join. We will be, we'll be bundling this up and sending out a recording for everyone uh, that wants to see it. Uh, so huge thank you. A great, uh, great session and really interactive from the floor as well. Will, any final comments? No, just a big thank you again. Thanks everyone for joining and uh, the joys of a post-COVID world, hopefully to, to be able to you know, wrap up now. There's no car journey home. We can log off and get on with our day. So uh, thanks very much everyone for joining. And get back to the beach if that's where, uh, if that's where <laughs> it takes you, Dan. <laughs> thank you, awesome. everyone. Enjoy thanks, your everyone. afternoon. Thanks very much, guys. Bye Have a good now. day. Bye. Bye.